Welcome to What She Said. I'm your host, Lucy Lucraft, a freelance journalist and blogger from London. Each week, I chat to awesome humans about their journey to where they are today, and we share lots of blogging tips and tricks too. You can hear the entire back catalogue, as well as new episodes wherever you listen to podcasts by searching for my name or searching What She Said, or you can go to my website, wanderloose.com. And if you want to come say hi online, I'm at Lucy Lucraft on Instagram or Twitter, or over at my blog, wanderloose.com. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of What She Said. It's episode 14 with the wonderful Carolyn of The Slow Traveller. So before we jump in, I need to do a little sales pitch, which I feel a bit uncomfortable about, but um, I just need to get over myself. So (laughs) my Simple SEO Success course is closing for enrolment on Tuesday, so tomorrow. Um, But before then, I am offering you 20% off with the code Easter Egg. So it's £60 full price um, and 20% off takes you to about £48. Um, If you want to know more about the course, there's lots of lovely testimonials of students who recommend it. Um, Then just head to the show notes and there is a link for you to have a look at everything. Okay, back to the episode. So I chatted with the wonderful Carolyn of The Slow Traveller. It's another giggle fest as we had a natter about Instagram, slow travel, photography, um, how and why Carolyn decided to do a degree in it. So full disclosure, you might be wondering why we didn't talk about her recent post that went viral when she hacked her own Instagram account. You might also be wondering why I didn't pick up on this because we actually talk about photoshopping and Carolyn's views on augmented reality and um, the Amelia Liana, Taj Mahal, Fiora Ray when people accused her of photoshopping tourists out of the picture. Um, I mean, Carolyn even says in the podcast that she's 33, so I don't know how I didn't work out <laughs> her Instagram hacking. Um, this will, if you haven't, if you don't know what I'm talking about, then go to her post. It's in the show notes. Um, it was really fascinating. Carolyn basically um, made a whole story of her 22 year old self and posted about it on Instagram with a really heavily photoshopped um, like face to make her look like she was 22. And um it was fascinating because nobody questioned it. We didn't question it even. Well, I'm sure some people did. But anyhow, um, I didn't question it. And I knew she was 33, not 22. So, it was, you know, it, it's pretty fascinating. So you might find when you get to the end of the podcast, you're thinking, what the fudge? Why didn't they talk about this? <laughs> so that's why, because we recorded it before it had all happened. Carolyn was super honest. She was really generous and funny. Um, and I felt really inspired after chatting with her. So if you're feeling a little bit meh about Instagram or about your career or about traveling, this is the episode for you. Welcome to the podcast. Hi there, Lucy. How are you doing? Good, thank you. How are you? I'm very well, and thank you for having me. Oh, I'm really excited to chat to you. So for anybody that doesn't know who you are, um, would you mind introducing yourself, please, and telling us a little bit about your blogging journey so far? Yeah, of course. So I am a freelance photographer from and based currently in Newcastle. Um, I also work as an influencer through Instagram as the slow traveller. Um, dabble a little bit in blogging as well, um, although it's been a while, I think. <laughs> need to get back on that. <laughs> I'm also currently studying um, a degree in photography and digital imaging, um, oh, wow. a university degree. And yeah, so that's that's about me right now. <laughs> Just a few little things to keep you busy. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> Nothing overwhelming whatsoever going no, on. No, no, not at all. Just a degree, a <laughs> thing on Instagram, a blog on the side. <laughs> yeah. Where did it all get started then? Because, so I was reading, I've read this post of yours a few times actually, because it really resonates with me. Um, it's the one about uh, why quitting your job to travel was the best thing you ever did Um, because I have quite a similar experience in that I quit my job to travel in a very similar way just having a glass of wine with my husband who was my boyfriend at the time both both kind of hating our jobs like should we just quit and go traveling yeah right then (laughs) that was pretty much it for me and Gary as well (laughs) literally we were just like shall we do that then oh yeah okay so we'll just (laughs) hand our notice in leave our flat and just go yeah 
and we we thought you know we were like oh yeah we've got a few grand saved as well so that should keep us going for a couple of years and yeah. um, that didn't really pan out but never <laughs> mind <laughs> the optimism um i think was the was the key thing there and um, yeah we well we were living in bath at the time um we'd lived previously in london for a little while mm-hmm. um, and that was just more about um kind of new opportunities for jobs and stuff like that gary's a journalist so oh, wow. he was working for future um uh-huh. in bath and i was working for a telecommunications company um in london but they let me kind of work from home in bath and it just it's i enjoyed it but it just wasn't something i was kind of passionate about and I started doing like a, an evening um, course, just like a really basic evening course in photography. And it was just really how to use a DSLR and um, just the basics of like digital photography. Yeah. Um, and I kind of thought, how can I get out of this? You know, how can I kind of try and do something that I really want to do um, without kind of things like university and stuff like mm. that? Um, and it was just, I thought, travel, firstly, something I'd, I'd always wanted to do. Um, secondly, I kind of thought it might be a good way into um, to starting a career in photography as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was just a case of um, same as you, really, Friday night, <laughs> you know, finished the, the week at work, a couple of beers, and I was just like, do you want to travel the world? And I thought it was kind of like there would be a bit of pushback, but there definitely wasn't. It was like, yeah, okay, definitely. And then we just spent, I think it was about a bit short of a year, just mm-hmm. kind of cutting back on, you know, the luxuries. We didn't eat out or go out to bars drinking, yeah. you know, that kind of thing, and just kind of saved save what we could and um, returned home. Both of us are from the northeast, so we kind of returned home to say, farewells to the family and stuff and then that was it for for two years we kind of popped back yeah um, twice within that time because the first year was kind of India and um Southeast Asia yeah. and the second year was Latin America so um you know we came home in between to you know just to show our phases I suppose but- it's so similar to my journey although I'm not making this into a big episode about me (laughs) yeah great Carolyn back to me (laughs) but that's basically what we did as well we spent our well we were away for two yeah two and a half years but we came back in between for a wedding and Christmas first chunk was India Southeast Asia but we basically stayed in that side of the world totally uh, because we ended up living in Thailand for a big chunk um yeah so and 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 same as you that's kind of where my new career developed so going back to because the photography was the thing that drove everything so at the time you weren't thinking oh I'm going to start an Instagram I'm gonna be an influencer I'm gonna be a blogger when did that happen that actually the Instagram actually came really in the second year but first It was actually right place, right time sort of thing because Mm -hmm. we were um, in northern India um, and we were trekking between India and Nepal when the big earthquake happened, the big Nepal earthquake. So, I mean, we weren't, you know, right at the centre of it, but we felt the earthquakes and we were stuck in Darjeeling for um, a few weeks. Oh, I love Darjeeling so much. Oh, no, it's amazing, isn't it? Did (laughs) you go to... um... It's totally off topic but did you go to that pub oh the one that the the one i think it's probably the, the only i think it's the only pub in darjeeling it's kind of right at the the really near the train station opposite um there's like a shopping center with dominoes oh, i don't know there's a pub with there a was fire one... Ch- <laughs> i don't know the pub with a fire <laughs> like england <laughs> yeah 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 it was wild no we we spent a lot of time in a bar that was owned by a guy that run ran sorry one of the most popular like excursion um, oh. adventure sort of yeah, yeah. places and that's how we ended up doing the trek so it was like a five or six day trek it was a bit mad um, and it was called the Singalila Ridge and it took yeah. you kind of between Nepal um, northern India and Sikkim as well. Oh, wow. um, but it was it was it was amazing. But yeah, and it was a case of Gary was already an established um, writer and yeah. journalist at the time, um, and that was kind of 
kind of the story. So yeah. he he pitched the story, and because I'd kind of sort of knew how to use the camera. I mean, I, would, <laughs> I will never show anybody those first pictures that were published. Yeah, I was surprised ever. when you said that. Were they bad? Oh God, atrocious! Yeah, <laughs> I hope the magazine aren't listening. By the way. <laughs> Uh, because they published them um no they were you know but I suppose it, it happens even if I look back to something that might have been published six month, months months yeah, ago I kind I of think oh, say, god it's I wish I could redo that again you know you, you, you're constantly improving it's all relative isn't it but I mean all I was using at the time with photoshop was literally like the basic um like contrast and clarity yeah. but but it, you know in a very over the top way yeah. they were, they were them straight yeah, up. Like, Look, I know how to use contrast and clarity. Yeah, straight <laughs> up. It was just a mess. But yeah, but the, but at the same time, you know, it kind of kickstarted something that I didn't really think was possible before I went traveling. So I'm not one of those people who, you know, would say everybody should do that or preach about it or anything like that. You know, everyone should travel the world and stuff because it's not right for everybody. And some people are lucky enough, I guess, to or fortunate enough to find you know, out who they are and what they want to do at an earlier stage. And, you know, that's, that's brilliant. For me, it was, it was, it was brilliant for me because it kind of, you know, it started a a whole new life, I guess. Yeah. That's amazing. That's such a, like, you know, from the outside, you're like, oh, you know, you go traveling and then become a journalist and a travel journalist and photographer, (laughs) like, it is so because we travelled with someone who um, they were journalist and photographer. Oh, okay. Um, and like friends that you had, or sorry, say that again. Friends that you met well, there, we just, or yeah, we just met them in Kerala. Yeah, we met them in Kerala and ended up travelling with them yeah. right up until mm, <clears throat> Campy, I think. And okay. they, yeah, so she was writing for. They were already kind of established in America. He was already a travel photographer. She was already a travel journalist. Um, but it was crazy because they ended up traveling for like, I don't know, I think they only came back maybe last year. Um, and they were traveling for like four or five years, writing for Condé okay. Nast. And, and so like, it's amazing that you did that after just a few months. It was only, what, four months? I know. Well, no, it was, so I left, we left in the January and I had work published I think it was maybe April. Wow. That's yeah, it was pretty mad. And and it wasn't, you know, I mean, I, I was in a very fortunate position because I was traveling with Gary. Mm. So had he not have been, you know, a journalist, would it have happened? Probably not. But at the same time, it was kind of like, it was just, it felt really amazing that I'd kind of done this really scary thing yeah. and felt like things were quite quickly starting to sort of fall into place and yeah and that was that was it so that was the start of it and I had a few published pieces through the two years that we were away but the Instagram happened I dabbled before I mean I didn't really I think I used to do what everybody probably did when I first first opened the app and thought it was just somewhere that you could edit pictures and then like I'd quickly delete the picture but it would save to your phone and then I would kind of publish these really weird kind of filter <laughs> pictures to Facebook yeah. and be like this is my real face these are the colors that I'm <laughs> um but yeah we spent a bit of time in Spain um between after India and Asia we wanted to learn Spanish because we knew that we were going to um travel around Latin America uh, okay. um and you need a degree of yeah. understanding and basic kind of knowledge of the language because I don't well, I don't know I don't know how you'd manage otherwise really mm. in some of the parts of Latin America so we we spent about four months in Spain we kind of got this little apartment up in the hills in Andalusia a place called Rio Gordo um and I just kind of I don't know I, I, that's when I started to because we just had all this time we were just sort of in in this apartment just kind of you know just dossing about really (laughs) (laughs) learning a bit of Spanish um and I started to post more maybe thoughtful pictures I was putting a little bit more effort into it I guess and but I didn't know that you know at the time I didn't really it wasn't about kind of 
becoming popular or about yeah. about kind of exposure or I didn't realize that you could make a job out of it or anything like that it was just I just really enjoyed it if you know what I mean and yeah. that's when that's when I kind of started to use Instagram properly and it was when I started posting pictures of the buildings in in Latin America once we got there Mexico was the first kind of place um, and I started to post buildings because I was really like amazed by all this colonial architecture you know, across the other side of the world that I didn't know anything about. Yeah. And people people love it. You know, people love that kind of... And I think because most people's largest audience on Instagram tends to be the US, and yeah. I suppose it's it's quite aspirational um, because the architecture in these places is so old in comparison to, I suppose, what they know. Yeah. But it's, it's interesting to see, and I think that's kind of what kick-started the... the my Instagram, and then it just kind of kicked off a little bit after that, I think. So when I'm quite interested in, um, because I have a similar, or a lot of people who are travel bloggers or travel photographers or travel writers, whatever, um, with Instagram that can be quite tricky because merging, going from your travel photography to when you're at home, Mm. how do you, yeah, because I know that's quite tricky for you because you've got a very, very, um, I mean, I love both styles of your photography, um, and it doesn't jar for me at all because it's very, you have a very unique style, but obviously everybody knows you, or there'll be a mm. quite big chunk of your audience who know you, your books and your beautiful window and, yeah. and your book stacks, um, and then when you're traveling, uh, do you find that quite a tricky thing to balance? Not now so much, and I think that's down to what you were talking about, about having a certain aesthetic and style Mm. that you've kind of developed, and I think that's why it doesn't jar so much. But when I first came home from the two years of travelling and during the time that I was away, I'd become popular for this kind of, these facades um, and this architecture. That's what my account was predominantly just buildings, basically. Mm. And I panicked a bit because we came home and, I, you know, I thought, you know, what, what am I going to kind of do? You know, it's this, my audience are kind of here for these beautiful buildings. And Newcastle doesn't have a great deal of that. Um, it's a beautiful city, but not, you know, yeah. to me, not not in the same sort of kind of romantic way, I guess, that, you know, you have in places like Buenos Aires and Mexico City and stuff like that. But um, and I don't know, I think it's just perseverance. I just kind of in a, I try to do it slowly as well so I kind of was still posting some of my older travel pictures which I still do now um Mm. and then kind of one one of each or a couple of a couple at home and in one building and that sort of thing and just kind of eased it in I suppose but I just kept going with it and I think with mine as well I think I use captions and the, the way that I it's more like a journal so the picture just is just there as a kind of pretty image to go alongside whatever I'm kind of you know mouthing off about that day (laughs) rather than rather than an image that's been created to represent what I've done today yeah yeah so I think that helps a bit as well you know because I think captions are are, you know important really when it comes to audience but yeah I think and now it's you know, I have, I'm not really traveling the same way as I was before. I mean, uh, I haven't been I haven't been away for quite some time now. I've got a couple of things coming up, but I just kind of tend to, you know, go between the two and and just try and kind of keep that that aesthetic, which I guess is the thing that makes it flow. Yeah, I suppose better. it's a bit like finding your voice in writing. There co- there comes a time when you don't think about it anymore, so. I guess it's the same with photography as well. Yeah, I think so, definitely. Because I, if, if you know, you could write about anything, and if it's in your voice, it's it's you. Mm. So I think this, you're right. I think the same goes for for photography, definitely. And did you find along the way, um, talk about your blog as well as your Instagram? Were there any mm. any stumbling blocks? Any times that you thought? I just, I can't do this. You know, especially when you kind of came home and started, you know, you you know, you are an influencer now. So when you got to that level, I'm quite interested to know 
the thing the things that people come up against. Do you mean with the blog? Both. Well, well, well I had and Instagram. Well, I had a blog before. So when I was travelling, I had started the blog, and it was kind of like, um, and this was before I had an audience, um, uh, I suppose. And I started, and it was kind of, I don't know, I tried to do this kind of these romantic little travel stories. So it wasn't like it wasn't like valuable factual information, which I think is what most people kind of want from a travel blog in a way. I tried to do something which I thought was unique and different. <laughs> and I, tr- I tried to do this kind of, some some of it was like photo stories, some of it was like, so I stayed at this mad hotel in, in Bangkok and it was where um, one of my favourite films was, um, so parts of it was shot. And I kind of done this really weird blog post where I tried to kind of take images that <laughs> sort of looked like scenes from the film and then sort of wrote this, weird you know that kind of thing I try to do something different and it just didn't work at all um you know because I don't I don't know what people you know I don't think people really would have got much from it if that makes sense oh do you know it's interesting that you say that because I totally understand what you mean there's a smaller audience for that type of writing for sure but do you know uh Brenna this battered suitcase no I don't think so So she writes very much in that way she writes you know she writes a bit of a combination but um she was on, I think, episode two or episode three of series one of the podcast. Well, have, have a listen. Yeah, have a listen. Um, uh, but also, I'm terrible because it's the first. It's the first <laughs> series, so I didn't know what. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> um, I was just rambling. Kind of like my first published pictures. So. Yeah. <laughs> At least you're confident enough that it's still available for people to listen to on the web on your website, though. <laughs> I do think about deleting them sometimes because they're just so <laughs> embarrassing. But um, yeah, so she writes like beautiful essays and like talks, of, you know, love stories and all sorts of things. And that's kind of her. Th- that is her thing. That's what she's yeah. known for. But I get, but I get what you said. What you're saying, you know, <laughs> when it's but I just suppose that, my I strong it's... point, I guess, is is more. Maybe just isn't writing. If if that makes sense, yeah. maybe you know, it's it, it was that. I think the the stuff that does well on my blog tends to be stuff about Instagram yeah. and for tip stuff, you know, like yeah. <clears throat> engagement on Instagram or um, how to take better pictures. Yeah. Um, and more recently, I've done the odd kind of opinion sort of thing. And if it kind of relates to social media or Instagram, it tends to do better. Yeah. Um, but you know, I suppose those are the things that I feel like I know a bit more about, so it just makes more sense to to kind of write stuff about the stuff I know a little yeah, bit about. Yeah, and the stuff that flows easier for you is always going to be yeah, better. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So when did it, so when you started that blog, when did that, well, two questions actually. I'm really interested to know what your favourite film is. <laughs> okay. Well, it's, it's in the mood for love by Wong Kar Wai. Oh wow! A Korean. That's a um, really interesting um, film. I haven't heard anyone say that before. Although I know it's very popular. Which was oh, the hotel? Oh, what was it called? I can't even remember now. But it's like I'll try and find it while we're speaking and tell you what it is. But it was. It's basically like a really old hotel, and it's like really like. They have all these posters around inside that say like, like, you know, like no sex and no, <laughs> no. It's, it's it's very strange and like it's it's so the rooms are really really basic and and there's posters about about that as well and that you know if you come and stay here you're not allowed to complain. They also don't have like you have to book through the website and they like basically vet. Amazing. Bet you a little bit before they accept. <laughs> like, so you're trying to spend money, and they're like, "Well, wait a minute, we, you know, we might, we might not let you do that." It's, it's a bit, very strange place, but it's really, really grand and beautiful in the kind of the public areas, like the the foyer and places like that. Um, lots of like, <clears throat> lots of reds and um, beautiful tiles and dark wood and. It's a very atmospheric place, um, and I can totally see why Wong Kar Wai chose to shot see, shoot scenes there because it's just you kind of feel like you've stepped into a another realm. 
Anyway, and I didn't particularly like Bangkok either, so it was kind of a bit of a refuge. But mm-hmm. we'd been we'd been kind of city hopping a bit, and I think Bangkok was like we got to Bangkok after kind of hopping between cities, and it was just like oh, we need a bit of we need a bit of nature, a yeah. bit of kind of. So I think that was probably one of the reasons. But yeah, um, have you seen the film? No, I haven't. I've never I seen definitely it. definitely recommend it. It's really beautiful. Visually, very beautiful. And a very kind of, just a, a very gorgeous story. But it's kind of voyeurism as well. You can, yeah. the, way it's, the way it's shot and the way you see it as a viewer, it's kind of like you're spying on this kind of relationship. It's very, very good. Yeah, sounds I'd amazing. Recommend. And I love Bangkok. It's one of my favourite cities. So, yeah, I need to go back. I think, in a different frame of mind, I think I'd see it in a completely, um, you know, different light. It was just wrong place, wrong time. Yeah, and actually, I, I think I wrote a post once about, um, you, you know, how you feel about places when you, you know, destinations. If you if you arrive at a destination before you are ready to leave the last destination that destination is kind of screwed you're not gonna really yeah. like it and it's the same if you leave a place before you're ready you're or I don't know I, I think there's so much about there's some places that I when I think of I just really think god I hated that place but I probably wouldn't if I'd have gone in a different no I totally agree totally agree I don't think you'd really hear anywhere would you I think yeah. it's just a case of are, are you kind of ready to be there are you in the right frame of mind exactly. You know, is it, or uh, you know, and if, 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 because of the fact that we'd spent the last maybe two weeks previous to that in cities, it was just, yeah. we just weren't, we didn't want to be there, if that yeah, makes sense. Yeah. It, but it wasn't really that we didn't like Bangkok as a city. It just was just more. Other cities. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. then we were just like, let's head up to the north and kind of chill out in, you know, in the countryside for a bit. But yeah, I would like to go back, definitely. I love the north of, um, Thailand. I oh, really me too. It. I've well, I, we, it. we didn't spend a lot of time in the south. Um, we went to Bangkok and then we took a train from Bangkok all the way up to Chiang Mai and okay. spent most of our time between there and Pai. Oh, but I it was off Pai. off season as well, so uh-huh. it was quite quiet, which yeah. was nice. Yeah, oh, I loved dreamy. it. There. I hate I Chiang Mai. I absolutely hate Chiang Mai. I've been so many times and I think I hate it because, I mean, that's a really stupid thing to say even, that I hate it because there's nothing really about it to hate. But I think it's because I'm really contrary and it used to really annoy me whenever I would read travel blogs. They'd be like, Chiang Mai is amazing. Like, all the US travel bloggers seem to live in Chiang Mai. And yeah. Because of that, I think I was like, well, I'm not going to like it then. Because everybody else likes because it. Because everybody else does, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like we were quite snobby when we first started traveling, and we were like, oh, "Who are all these tourists? Yeah, <laughs> being tourists. We, we, you know, we just like to walk about, and you know, who are all these people at these tourist sites? And we were like, we're tourists, though. We're doing yeah. exactly the same thing. You become a bit snobby, don't you? <laughs> totally, totally. I yeah, travel snobbery is just um, it's so funny because, but I also <laughs> experience, and I'm sure you did too. Um, the people, especially in India. India was the worst for this. People who were snobby of me, like I wasn't um, good enough traveller because I don't know, I wasn't eating dirt and yeah, and went walking outside. around with no shoes on. Even though Indian people oh, don't do that, yeah, I know. Very strange. Saying. Yeah, <laughs> the no shoes thing used to really bug me because I was like, it's India is one of the dirtiest places I've ever been. There's so much cow poo everywhere. I don't want to. <laughs> Walk in but, but not even the locals do. No, so I know. It's, it's like why? So I don't know. I don't kind of understand the concept. No, me neither. But each to their own. Yeah, yeah. quite. I <laughs> really understand it. <laughs> I'm making this all about travel, and I shouldn't. Although I'm sure people will be super interested um, to hear all about your travel life and all of your favourite destinations and everything. But um, I think they'll probably be more interested in the things that really kick-started everything for you. So we talked about, obviously, that you got published when you were on the road. And, I mean, it's pretty clear to see you're such an amazing photographer. That, oh, thank you. Yeah, oh, you're amazing. You take the most beautiful pictures. That, obviously, you're going to do well on Instagram. Um, but what, what point did you feel like you were, I don't know, you've made it, as it were, or... 
at what point did it become something that could be a full-time job? Um, well, I think I kind of saw it as that from the beginning that I'd kind of risked, you know, leaving mm. a job that paid a decent salary and stuff to kind of pursue this. And to be honest, I spent, even though I had work published, it's only been recently um, that it started money-wise or um, kind of living up to anywhere near, you know, what I'd been earning doing a, a, a proper job, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so it's, I think it, it was about kind of wanting it enough to kind of take that risk and live, you know, live a certain way, if, if that makes sense. And like as in taking the risk before you're ready, not waiting until someone says to you, this is it, you are, you are officially able to give up your job. Oh, definitely. Doing I mean, it yeah giving yourself permission basically yeah and I think it's and I didn't know you know I didn't know what was going to happen I didn't all I'd done was this this night course and I kind of knew what buttons to press on on the crappy DSLR that I spent (laughs) 200 quid on you know back a few years ago um but I think and I think moving I think this when I kind of started to move away from the, from my hometown, I think that was the start of it really, actually. And that, you know, I lived London and then Bath, and that was about three years in total. And I think without, in hindsight, that, that was the start of it, I think. Yeah. It was this kind of thinking, instead of, I don't know, kind of waiting for something to happen, which never will, yeah. it was kind of like, I need to start moving. I need to start kind of doing something that's different to what I'm doing right now because, you know, otherwise this is this is good, this is how it's going to be, you know, yeah. for the for the rest of my life, I guess, or working life anyway. Which yeah. wasn't the prospect wasn't really making me happy, um, and it's only been quite recently that I've started to think, oh, okay, so this is actually, you know, I'm starting to reap the rewards a little bit of that kind of period of of or the, the risk that I that I took, but then there's still that kind of because it's not the same as having a kind of nine to five with a contract and a salary, there's still that kind of niggling thought where you kind of think this is too good to be true. You know, you know, I can't, I can't be, I can't be earning money from photography, no way. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but I think it's just about, you know, if you want, if you do want something enough and it's not all roses, it's kind of, it's, it's, it is tough you know, and it's like, I guess it's just, yeah, about about perseverance, I suppose. Yeah, 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 definitely. And I think um, there's a bit of a lesson in making things happen. And you say this in the post where you talk about quitting your job to travel and, you know, luck. I think luck can really be something that holds us back using, using the word luck because then you mm-hmm. almost exclude yourself from that. And it means that you are just waiting and definitely but then on the flip side of that there's also the you know in western society there's this kind of unrealistic idea that we're fed that you can do anything you want and I think that can also be a problem too I think it's about finding because it's just because you can't it's that's not it's not realistic it doesn't work like that yeah you know, athletes are athletes for a reason kind mm-hmm. of thing. And I think it's it's about kind of finding the balance. Is this something that you want enough to make happen? But is it, you know, and ca- can you actually do it sort of thing? And yeah, but... Yeah, it's like the sweet spot between the two. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting that you say that because I think quite a lot of people won't say that, won't say those, because it feels a bit... I think you're right. I think we are fed that line. You can do anything. You can, especially as women, you can, well, it's kind of a two-pronged yeah. thing because actually it's not It's not a compliment to say you can do anything you want. <laughs> you can be a mum and have 25 children and you can still have your career and you can do this. Like, well, actually, no, you can't do all of those things. No, I know. That is exactly. also okay. <laughs> but, but what happens because of that, because we are told that in our society is that then comes 
the the negative effects mm. of that which leads to feelings of you know inadequacy yeah. and you know that you're you're you know not doing enough yeah, yeah. and then and then and then that you know the results of that can be sometimes you know fatal if that makes sense it's yeah, just totally, yeah. yeah it can kill your dreams can't it because you just think well like, yeah no I completely agree um but on to much happier stuff because you did do <laughs> <laughs> bit too deep I think <laughs> not at all I love it I could do this all day but I suddenly thought people listening might suddenly be saying oh that's it I'm, you know, I've had enough <laughs> I can't do any of it. <laughs> Karen and Lucy have told me, give up your dream. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't dream. <laughs> Stop dreaming, you fool. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously, this amazing dream did happen for you. You made it happen um, because you're talented enough and you you made it happen. And yeah, I suppose there was an element of timing in there as well and all the rest of it, but it happened which is awesome what does your typical and I know saying typical is actually kind of ridiculous um <laughs> when you're self-employed but what does your kind of <laughs> typical work week look like well at the minute because um well I'm in the second semester of a second my second year at university so it's 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 hard to kind of try and balance mm-hmm. the two things um so I've kind of I took quite a lot of work on um, through Instagram and photography at the back end of last year, um, which meant that this kind of part of the semester, I can focus a bit more on yeah. university because it's very intense. So I've taken on a couple of um, kind of longer term jobs <clears throat> just to make up for, you know, you know, yeah. paying for rent and money and that kind of yeah. thing. But um at the minute it's kind of a lot of the focus is going into um into university and the projects that I'm kind of working on which are so different from it's so weird because it's they're, they're so different from the stuff that I do on Instagram it's quite weird to try and find a balance I mean it all feeds into the same thing it's all photography yeah. but they're so different it's kind of do people know who you are at university I think more recently, there's people, I think my lecturers have recently found out and stuff, which I kind of, I don't know, there's this weird, embarrassing feeling, mm. which, and I don't know why, it's just, I think it's because they're, you know, old school, a couple of them are like documentary photographers mm. and, um, you know, sculptors and, you know, these kind of really traditional, you know, people that work in traditional yeah photographic or artist ways that it's I kind of in my mind I think will they understand what mm. I'm doing but I think they kind of understand that social media is you know a huge thing now even for kind of <clears throat> photographers that are more classed as kind of fine art photographers and yeah. it's still just as important so I think <clears throat> I mean I don't know what they think but I think they kind of understand that you know that it's not that I can kind of do both of them and neither one of them mean any less, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. But it's, it's quite, it is quite strange. What made you decide to do the degree? Well, I'd always, I'd always wanted to do a degree, but I didn't really know. I, there was nothing that I kind of wanted enough to learn about to do a degree. It was kind of like I hadn't found that thing. Yeah. And it's, I'm always impressed when I come across, so a lot of the, the students that are, are, are on my course are obviously young people mm-hmm. who've came out of college or uh, A-level. So, you know, I'm, I'm 33 almost, and some of the, the people that I'm kind of working alongside are, you know, 18, 20, that kind of thing. And yeah. it's I'm always really impressed that they've kind of, because with photography, it's not, it's not the same as doing like a, you know, a business degree mm. or maths or something a bit more academic. So it kind of impresses me that these people are that into something like photography enough to, to kind of spend their money and, you know, spend three years doing it. And I'm just kind of, 
I think as well, because I knew that we were coming home after traveling, it was just, I thought, well, I can do this now. You know, I'm going to invest these three years. And I think you can never be, you can never learn enough about a subject. And while I was teaching myself photography, it became a bit of an obsession. Like while we were traveling, I would spend hours and hours every single day doing tutorials online, reading about photography every single day. And and now I get to, to kind of learn, but from people who, you know, are specialists in the field. And it's really amazing for things like, I'm really into like kind of the philosophy behind in the theory and the, the critical side of it and stuff. So mm-hmm. it's just, yeah, it's, it's brilliant. And I'm just glad that I've, that I've, I'm able because of what I do outside of uni, I'm able to, to do it, I suppose. But yeah. That's awesome. It's so awesome. I think it's, I, I'm always impressed when people know what they want to do at the age of 18. And oh, how? Well, controversially, I personally think that it's ridiculous to, for anyone to think at 18 they know what they want to do. And it's great if you do, but I think that well, I th- I agree schools with you. push you into, push you into I know. stuff. When I, you're asked to choose subjects at the age of kind of what what is it 14 15 yeah, exactly. like 15 you're just like years. I was an idiot or like yeah, I was too. just a complete <laughs> moron <laughs> like I, I had no idea what the hell I was doing yeah, of course so not. to think you know and I, I don't I had got rubbish GCSEs I didn't stay on at school I didn't do A levels you know I went straight into a job because I was more interested in going out and yeah. you know buying crap clothes and because you're young so, that's what that's, that's yeah what you're I know doing, just learning about life I, I think we just I think one of the most damaging things is the fact that university, when probably, I mean, I'm a bit older than you, but when we were younger, became so accessible. And I think that's, yeah, just one of the most terrible things that could happen. I Mm. understand why it was, you know, Labour were kind of, their whole thing was making it less elitist and making it so that everybody could go to university, which is great. Everyone should be able to go to university if they want. But actually what happened is that, you know, hundreds and thousands and millions of people went into university degrees, which then got completely devalued because everyone was doing them. They came out of university and everyone has a degree. So they're not earning any more money. They've got a shed load of debt. Uh, It's just, yeah, stupid. Yeah, no, I mean, a couple of my friends... um have some of them have two or three degrees because the first degree that they did was they've done you know they don't have any interest in that subject anymore mm. and so they've they've gone and done other degrees yeah and Gary my my partner he done the same so he I think like his, his first one was like sports science or something mm. very kind of you know because he was a, a young lad yeah. and then he went much later and done um a degree in journalism and then recently done his master's in creative writing but Mm. he was he was older than you know than most of the people that were on the course at the time because you know he tried and failed before because it just wasn't he he didn't know at the time but had no interest in in that subject it's kind of yeah I I agree with you I don't know how at that age you can kind of know it's ridiculous isn't it and you shouldn't need to know. Like, no, you, should just, you shouldn't. No, no. Just live your life. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> like, you're going to be working till. I mean, by the time my daughter retires, she'll probably be 120. So just chill out. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> got so much time. <laughs> yeah. Just go work somewhere that's fun for now. Don't worry about just, degrees. Yeah. <laughs> just leave school, get a job, booze. <laughs> This is the least inspirational podcast out there at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Quit your dreams. <laughs> Booze. Booze. Don't worry about a degree. It's nonsense. We're all screwed. You're going to be working till you're 120. <laughs> no, but it is. No, I'm really, I feel very um, fortunate that I'm able to do it now. And, and the fact that they kind of allowed me to do it based on just life experience mm. was, you know, you know, I didn't have to do any courses or do an access course or anything like that. It was just a case of I had a a Skype, I was in Chile at the time, had a Skype interview with the the leader of the course and and he was just like, yeah, 
come and I was like okay <laughs> <laughs> so but it's been a real eye-opener I'm um I have t- days where I'm like Gary I'm leaving I'm leaving <laughs> this is having an effect on my <laughs> and he's like okay we'll talk about it tomorrow and then and the next thing I'm like look at this exciting stuff look at this, you know look what I'm learning about and he's like you're not leaving now then yeah um <laughs> One thing I wanted to ask you about, because I think it's a bit hot topic at the moment, and it's, probably, it's quite interesting because obviously you're learning a lot more about photography and, and you know, taking it really back to basics probably and going back to philosophy and theory and all of those sorts mm. of things. What are your thoughts on the current trend of Photoshopping? And because, So I have a Facebook group for this podcast, and um, mm. each week we talk about struggles and things that you know everybody gets a bit honest and says oh this week I feel crap about this or this week I feel great about this whatever and I a lot of people have said Instagram I f- I'm feeling really down on my Instagram because I just don't want to have to use Photoshop and and I don't know how to use it but I feel like mm-hmm. I can only get ahead if I if I do that um what are you and when I say using Photoshop I don't mean to edit your your pictures or tweak pictures I mean, you know, for kind of... Manipulation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Would that be the word? Manipulation or augmented reality and things like that. Mm. Not even just cinema graphs, to be honest. Things beyond that. What do you think about that? Has that been something that you feel... Well, I think... I just think Instagram has kind of moved on and is is always moving on so much that... And I think people people kind of are learning, even as viewers, learning more about photography. And so taste shifts and changes too. And so I think maybe, I don't know, I think, and with manipulation, I mean, it's been around since the start of photography. Mm -hmm. And obviously in a different way, you know, things like photo montage and um, the alteration of of chemical um, photography processes and that sort of thing. It's always always been done as long as photography's been around, most of the time to kind of make, say something or make a point. Mm-hmm. So I, d- I don't really, I don't think people should feel pressured into doing it as a way to move forward because it's not, like anything else, it's not everybody's thing. Mm. I think if, but I don't think there's anything wrong with it either. Um, I think if, if it, what you're trying to say or the idea that you have in your mind requires some form of manipulation and you can do it then there's it's it's no different from from just taking you know a normal picture it, there's no difference to me as long as I think I touched on this you know what happened with that Amelia Liana quite some time ago where oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> where she was where she was um the accused of house. yeah yeah, photoshopping um, backgrounds into her images. I can understand why people find that distasteful. Yeah. But at the same time, it's just a case of, I don't know, I just think... I just think, who cares? No, I just, <laughs> Do you know what I, I mean? No, but, I, I, yeah, so I, I think it's, it might not have the same meaning as some of the pioneers of... Mm. of of manipulation historically, like Hannah Hock, who who made these really political um, photo montages, she was you know recycling and reworking other people's images from magazines. And she was saying something political, so then it, then I suppose it, it, it might be more meaningful. But I think I think there's better ways to react to something that you don't particularly like than <laughs> you know attacking people I guess yeah, yeah, so I, I, I just think yeah I just think like I would hate to think that people were worried about not being able to use photoshop in that kind of way and think that without that skill that you you can't have you know you can't grow your Instagram account because I think I, 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 I don't think that's right to be honest I, I don't agree with that and I, I guess I don't do a great deal of that myself. I think most of most of my images are. I use Photoshop, obviously, mm-hmm. um, but I don't. You know, it's not an account of manipulated kind of that kind of style of photography. Yeah, I'll do. 
you know, things that I need to do to make sure that I'm happy with the image. Um, but I just, I don't think, I think you can definitely still grow your account and have, um, you know, and move forward without that skill. Yeah. But people who choose to use that type of photography is absolutely fine. Yeah, I agree. I just, it makes me sad when people get so stressed about Instagram. And I don't mean that to sound, um, it's a really fine line to walk sometimes when you're talking about Instagram, because I don't want to put down anybody who has, who's like you, has worked really hard and is an influencer on Instagram and is, you know, part of your job. And like Dominique or Sarah, both friends of the podcast, <laughs> or yeah. Hannah, you yes, know, I'm like looking just, forward to listening to um, to. Is, did you just did it go out today? Uh, Monday. Day, okay. So I remember funny. seeing it. On, yeah, my days are blurring. In <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to listening to that. And um, we yeah. talk about you in it as so. <laughs> well. <laughs> but yeah, like I'm, I don't want to put down anybody who, but you know. Everyone just needs to calm down, I think. You know, if it isn't your job right now and you don't want it to be, and even if you do, like Dominique said something about, you know, you've got, you've got to kind of experiment and have fun. Oh, definitely. Find your style. That's important. That's as important as all the other things that you should be doing to grow your Instagram. One of the most definitely important Definitely trying and testing and yeah. failing. You know, you learn yeah. so much from, you know, and, and it's, I think it's unfair because people people should be trying things and testing things to move forward. There's a lot of pressure at the minute for, you know, but it should be real. It should be mm. this, that and the other. And, it, and it, it, it can have an effect on people to the point where they just stop making work. And that's yeah. that's the most tragic thing ever, yeah. you know. I th- yeah, totally. I think, yeah. And um, failing, that's that is important. You, you can't be frightened to fail. Although we all are, but it's not failure on such yeah, a grand scale. Yeah, we all are, scale. definitely. Have you but ever I mean, had... Just... Yeah, and I got, are you, you going to say? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, some of the pictures I've posted on Instagram, if I've tried something new, mm. like, I look back and I think, God, what, <laughs> what on earth was I thinking there? But it's part and parcel of learning, isn't it? Yeah. And, you know, I think, like I said before, to kind of... to progress and to move forward you have to you have to try Mm. stuff out and test stuff and you know yeah somehow I think that with Instagram and podcasts are the same and YouTube I think is the same it's a medium unlike any other where people feel a lot more entitled to criticize Mm -hmm. Um, it's not it's not (laughs) so much the same with blogging although yeah there's criticism but you don't really expect people's if if you went back over my first blog posts I mean just don't even look at them they make me feel really (laughs) upset (laughs) they're so bad they are so so bad like the writing is bad it's not so bad that you think oh my god you're terrible you can tell there's a good writer in there but you can tell it's a good writer hidden really really far down Mm. (laughs) the photos are horrific everything about it is terrible they're so cringeworthy but but isn't it also great to see the journey as well and exactly. to see how far you've come and how you've yeah. progressed? And Totally. And I leave them up there. It's really important. It is really important. And it doesn't... It, I don't feel like if anyone looks at those, they would think any less of my writing now. But somehow mm. with Instagram or with early podcast episodes or with YouTube, people feel really entitled that they can have an opinion on how you're changing and how you're evolving or you didn't used to do things like this but now you do and do you know what I mean I don't know if I'm making myself clear but I I think I think it's people are like that about pretty much everything especially in I don't know you know when you think about things like um food snobbery Mm. or um you know, there's lots of, you know, a lot of people taking, you know, the moral high ground and it's kind of like my opinion on, on nothing. Yeah, and it's just true. a bit kind of, you know, you know, people should just be able to kind of get on and do what they want to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. That's probably a good um, note to end it on. <laughs> just do what you want to do, guys. <laughs> no, but not. I, I just think nothing's ever as black and white as... Is, we kind of want there to be an answer for everything, I think. Yeah. 
it's human nature, but there's just not, you know, nothing's ever as black and white as, as that. So I think instead of, I always feel like instead of talking about something that you don't agree with or that you see as negative, to me, the, the better idea would be to just focus on what, you, you know, what, what you, what you can do to, to, to be more positive or mm. to, you know, if you believe, really believe in something, then to me, it, it's a case of, well, focus on doing what you can to, to do that thing rather than focus on the stuff that, you know, other people are doing that kind of questions that or isn't the same yeah it just seems like a backward way of doing doing stuff I suppose yeah I agree it can really hold you back as well can't it yeah definitely so where can everybody find you online so um Instagram which is um the slow traveler um I also have my blog which is um the slow traveler.net um I kind of tweet from time to time um and that actually do you know what I think it's yeah Slow traveller the because I couldn't get um I couldn't I think it was Who taken. Stole it? We need to <laughs> kick them off. <laughs> yeah, it obviously wasn't a great, a great, um a great kind of business move, the the slow traveller, you know, at the time when I chose it. Sometimes I think I wish I could just, you know, use my name now, but I feel like oh. I can't I kind of can't let go of it. I know, I, I'm in the same boat at the moment. I'd really like to get rid of Wanderlust and just be Lucy Lucas. Just, but... just be you. <laughs> yeah, but whatever, it's too much of a fan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm the same. <laughs> Thank you so much for being part of the podcast. No, it's been lovely. Thanks for having me, Lucy. Thanks for listening to what she said. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed the episode and if you did, please think about leaving me a five-star rating and a review if you have time. This really helps other people find the podcast and means that Apple don't hide me in their vaults. If you fancy joining my small but perfectly formed bunch of podcast fans for chit chat on Facebook, head to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash what she said podcast and come and join us.